Let us pray. Father, we were worshipping you this morning, Lord, saying that we wanted to fill this place. That you indeed, Lord, are the King of glory. Father, let all that we do, all that we, we ask, all that we seek, every activity we put our hands to, Father God, if it not be for your glory, then have it removed from our presence, Father God, in our minds. But let everything we do be for your glory. Let every word spoken, Father God, be unto your glory and your glory alone. We thank you this morning, Father God, Jesus. We worship you and we honor you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would minister in our midst this morning. Quicken your word in our spirits, Father God. Draw us close to you, my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you long for a greater relationship with God? Do you long for a continued outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you long to just not know about Jesus, but to know Jesus, encounter him, experience him? Do you long to see your marriage restored? Do you long to see your children and loved ones standing beside you, praising and worshipping God? Do you long for that breakthrough regarding a work situation or a financial challenge? Do you long for that breakthrough in overcoming a health challenge? Do you long to see that gifting that God has placed within you released for the greater good of his kingdom? Do you long to see revival sweep across our nation? Do you long to see that stubborn sin gone, a secret sin you've harbored for years, maybe even for decades, finally removed? Do you long to see godly people in government leading our nation according to the word of God? Do you long to see the prodigal sons and daughters from afar returning home? Do you long to see fire from heaven released in our midst? Do you long to see the glory of God? The fulfillment of all of these things we long for is first birthed in prayer. Spurgeon said, if a church is to be what it ought to be for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. It is a slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Whenever God determines to do a great work, he first sets his people to prayer. You know, when you survey the Bible, we see so many examples of a pattern. People pray, God moves. People pray, God moves. People pray, God moves. We've heard Pastor Paul share before about the Moravian prayer meeting. It was a prayer meeting that lasted for over 100 years. He shared about Count Zinzendorf, who owned an estate, and all of these refugees had come to the estate, something like 300 plus. And they were fighting with one another until they were hearing sermons on love. The fire of God fell in their midst, and they came together in prayer. Here's what happened after that moment. On August 27, 1727, two weeks after that renewal, 24 men and 24 women agreed to spend an hour each day in scheduled prayer, covering all 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. The ID soon grew, and the practice of continual prayer went on nonstop for more than 100 years. Out of this prayer meeting, the Moravians felt called to engage in foreign missions, and they are considered the forerunners of missions. Within 65 years, they had sent 300 missionaries around the world. They sent them to North and South America, Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the Arctic. You know, they were the first to evangelize to slaves. Some of them even sold themselves into slavery just so they could minister to the slave community. It's the equivalent of today saying, I'm going to be deliberately arrested so that I could end up in Long Bay Jail with only one mission. I want to reach those inmates. 
The Moravians were also the first to send laymen into the missions field rather than just ordained minister. Who's heard of John Wesley? Many of us have heard of the great John Wesley. He traveled to Georgia before he was a Christian on a ship that carried some Moravian missionaries. In the middle of the Atlantic, a storm came upon them suddenly, catching the crew unprepared, and it was a chaotic scene. The mast snapped. Everyone's gone into a panic. Except the Moravians, who were praying and singing together calmly on deck. This made a deep impression on Wesley, and he eventually became a follower of Christ at one of their meetings back in England. Now, prior to him becoming a Christian back in England, let me describe to you briefly what the state of England was like at the time. The Church of England was referred to as being spiritually dead. The evangelical gospel of salvation by grace through faith was not preached, nor believed by the majority of the Anglican priests, as the majority of them embraced deism. And if you were to listen to their sermons or read their writings, it's hard to determine whether they were Confucius, whether they followed Muhammad, whether they followed Jesus. Alcohol was rampant. Every sixth home was known as a grog shop, which basically is a cheap bar where for a penny you could get drunk. Every sixth home... Just think about your own street. Imagine every sixth home being like an undercover bar or pub. Gangs roamed the streets terrorizing anybody out after dark. They would disfigure people's faces with knives. They would grab swords and stab people in their legs. They would sexually assault women. They would commit murder. Law enforcement was failing. Criminals multiplied. The slave trade was widespread. And they were even selling tickets to watch public executions, almost like going to a theater. The Moravians in England had established what was known as the Fetterland Society, whose purpose was to provide a discipleship and accountability space. It was with this group that John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, another great mighty general of God, and a number of other young men joined to conduct a watch night service on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1738. Now, the Moravians in Germany, following the early church, had this custom of fellowshipping around a common meal. They would call it a love feast. And basically, they'd come around together for a meal. They would eat before partaking communion. So they did the same thing on this New Year's Eve, following the meal and communion. And as the new year arrived, the 60 young men had gathered together, continued with their praying and worshipping the Lord. When according to the journal of John Wesley, which he dated the 1st of January 1739, so 24 hours later, He recalls this happening. Mr. Hall, Hinching, Ingham, Whitfield, Hutching, and my brother Charles, so he's describing obviously those closest to him, were present at our love feast in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren. About three in the morning, as we were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little from that awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. What happened after that? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Fetalane was so powerful. And what those young men experienced was so real that it had set an anchor in their soul. And they were changed forever. Within a few months of that watch night service, George Whitfield and the Wesleys were preaching in the fields and moving the hearts of tens of thousands of people toward Christ. Between 1738 and 1791, it is estimated that 1.25 million people converted to Christ. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit during the Fetalane watch night service on December 31st, 1738, was a spiritual inauguration for the public ministry of the Wesleys and the beginning of the Methodist Church. The subsequent spreading revival cut across denominational lines and involved every segment of society. Wesley practically changed the outlook and even the character of the entire English nation. Historians believe that with the prayer meeting at Fetterlane, and a subsequent spiritual awakening throughout England, that the nation was saved from being sucked into something like the French Revolution 
and its reign of terror. An entire nation's identity was shifted. And to think that all of this flowed from a group of refugees that met on another man's property, heard the gospel of love, fire of God came down upon them, and then they said, let's commit our time to prayer. You know, on March 29th of last year, Pastor Paul challenged the church with one question. How shall we respond? He gave us the answer. It was our time to shine, to awaken and arise in faith, power and discernment. It's time to rise up as part of the great army of God in this day and this age. We need to be people who press in to find out what God wants to work in and through us. He also encouraged and inspired us to go beyond the realms of praying for five or ten minutes. That we needed to get beyond that. And pray and pray and press in until we can say like the word of God said about Samson. The Spirit of God has come upon me mightily. You know, that word was not just for last year's season. I believe it was a battle cry for the body of Christ and in particular victory life. It was a challenge to say we need to press in. The Bible says, yeah, you are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5.13. Such a basic condiment when you think about it, and there isn't really much to say about salt other than it has two functions. One of the functions is that it adds flavor to food. It enhances flavor. And so if you think about it as salt of the earth, we're like these little salt granules that are spread out all over the place to enhance, to bring flavor. Who do we do that for? We do that for the glory of God. Now, salt has a second function. The second function of salt is to hold back decay to stop corruption. So before refrigerators, people would you know, season meat with salt to try to preserve the meat and let it last a little bit longer. And there's still some parts of the world that do that as a, as a nice flavored food. They'll, they'll season it just with salt, just so it doesn't decay. Likewise, you and I, as salt of the earth, have a responsibility to hold back the forces of corruption. Moral corruption, social corruption, political corruption, until the purposes of God, through his grace and mercy, have been worked out in this world of ours. How do we do that, saints? We pray. And we pray. We pray to seek God's will. We pray to seek God's direction. We pray so that we can understand how best to overcome the world. To see great things happen, we must take great action. And to take great action involves sacrifice. Over the last few weeks, we've been speaking about digging up the wells, the clogged wells, about drilling into the hardened ground, uh, stepping out into the Jordan by faith. All of these messages, and these, are, these were words from God. They all had a common theme in them. They involved you and I needing to take action. Needing to take action. What is the key action we must take? At Victory Life, it feels as though we've hit a crossroads where our time has come to press in together like never before. With intensity, with purpose, we need to be pressing in with perseverance, with persistence and great tenacity. Saying, God, I will not stop seeking you until I get an answer. Are we willing to pay a price to offer a sacrifice of time, of effort, of energy? To set aside our own agendas and our own programs and all the things that life fills our time up with. To seek him in prayer at his holy altar. The cost we pay to seek him in prayer will be far less than the cost we will pay if we don't. And let me say that again. Whatever the price is that we pay. Whatever things we put aside, whatever things we push away so that we can pursue God in prayer, that will cost us nowhere near what we are going to pay if we are not pursuing him in prayer. Let me paraphrase what Derek Prince says about this. He addresses it very well. He says, what kind of spiritual sacrifice does God expect us to offer? 
Just as Jesus offered up prayers and petitions during his life on earth, so should we. He says, when we learn to pray, then we are qualified to rule. Choosing to understand the power of prayer and take your place as a person of prayer in God's kingdom is a momentous decision. Are you willing to say, God, if you can make me into a priest for your kingdom, I'm willing to pay the price. It's easy to say, but are we willing to pay the price to say, God, I push everything aside to seek you in prayer? There is no higher calling. When you pray, you have reached the throne. Others may not see you, nor may anybody ever know, but your life will count for God for time and eternity. You may not consider yourself this afternoon to be a strong prayer. You may say, look, it's not something that I'm able to do. But if you offer yourself, God will fashion you. God will fashion you. It might mean we need to change a few things in the way that we've done things before, but the difference is going to be answered prayer. In Leviticus chapter 6, there's an account there of the Lord giving Moses instructions on how to prepare the burnt offering. And he says, command Aaron and his sons, I'm reading from verse 9, command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offerings. The burnt offering shall be on the earth upon the altar all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. We go down to verse 12. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering on it in order. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offering. Verse 13. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. We must keep the fire on the altar burning. The sacred fire was never permitted to go out. I want you to think about our congregation. This be the temple of God. When we gather, one of the things we, we, we praise God for is where we gather two or three and we gather in his name, he's in the midst. When God is in the midst, we are on holy ground. We are on holy ground. God has sent the fire in his altar in this place. But how do we keep it burning? We keep, you add wood to keep a, to keep a fire burning. How do we gather wood? Prayer. Devotion, seeking God, worship. Every time we're praying, we're gathering wood. We're gathering wood. And our prayer from this house needs to be going up nonstop to God. The Moravians proved to the world that keeping the fire on the altar burning for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for 100 years was not impossible. Prayer is the key. It is one of the greatest privileges, the opportunities and ministries available to every believer. Why am I emphasizing prayer? Because we want to see the power of God released. Not just sing about it, but see it happen. We need to be praying. If we want to see his glory, we need to pray. If we want to overcome the challenges we face and the magnitude of the insidious things rising up against the people of God, we must pray. You know, there are things coming against the church of God and God's people that no man, no intellect, no strength, nothing can overcome. It requires divine intervention. These things can only be overcome and defeated by the one who sits on the throne. And when we pray and when we seek him in prayer, God extends his mighty hand in our midst and delivers his people. Amen. Ask yourself a question this morning or this afternoon. What things are stopping you from pressing into prayer and pursuing God? And the answer to those things is what you need to confront and hit head on. And say, no. What's stopping me from, from pressing into those things of God? You know, Pastor Paul, when he was saying not to, you know, the, the days of the five or ten minutes of praying, 
you know, we need to be pursuing more than that in the message that he shared on last year. He actually said in that same message, he goes, you know, five or ten minutes is good for a new believer, but this is a mature body. We're not going to pursue God moving forward in prayer in minutes. We want to pursue him in hours. We want to be seeking God. We need to get about us a spirit of perseverance, a spirit of tenacity, where we learn how to tarry, where we learn how to seek God, where we bring our flesh into submission, where we say, no, I'm tired and I'm hungry and I'm all these things, but you will come under my control because I am seeking my God. We bring every thought, we get, we get hold of it captive and we say, no, flesh, you listen to me. I don't listen to you. In the last few weeks, I've been sharing at Bible college on the subject of prayer, and we may be looking at Derek Prince, a great man of God who has done many studies on prayer. And he had identified within Scripture you know, eight what he calls conditions for how to approach God in prayer. So that's interesting. I've never thought about it. There's, there's certain conditions, there's certain things we need to look at. And here's what they are. I'm just going to summar- summarize them very quickly. Because what I'd like to do is by the end of this message to have the team back up, we're going to push the chairs back, we're going to come to the front together, and we're going to seek God in prayer together. Really want to encourage you with that. We need to be doing this together, in unity, together, seeking God together, persevering together, moving forward together, crying out to Him together. We don't leave anyone behind. The army, oh God, if someone's down, then the brothers and sisters lift that person up, and we move forward together. It's what we do as a family. It's what we do as a body. These conditions, the first one, we must come to God with reverent submission. When we look at Hebrews 5, 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So whilst, the part of this, whilst this part of the verse provides us with an example of Jesus as our priest and the way that he offered up petitions to the Father during his earthly ministry, we are told something that is integral to effective prayer. The Father always heard the prayers of the Son. Why? Because the Son had reverent submission. That is the first condition for approaching God in prayer. What's an example of reverent submission? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, God, here I am. Your will, not mine. Your will be done. Lord, teach me, show me how to cancel out, how to renounce my own will and seek your will and your will alone. Reverend submission means, God, am I asking for this because I wanted or because you wanted? Am I seeking this thing because it's something that I need or something that belongs to you in your glory? We need to have faith when we pray. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You may say this morning, well, my faith levels aren't that big. Go to God and ask. Faith comes. Faith comes. But we seek God and we say, Lord, Teach me, increase my faith. Holy Spirit, help me, show me. When we pray, we must pray in the name of Jesus. When we pray in the name of Jesus, there's three things that happen. We are coming in the name of Jesus to God on the basis of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Manny touched on it in communion. When we look at what what it means, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, that when we focus on that, what, what, what does that mean? Who have I become? Who is God? What happens? The second thing, when we pray in the name of Jesus, we are coming to God on the basis of Jesus, of who Jesus himself is, not who we are. We are coming in the name and, and, and it's who he is. It has nothing to do with me. And finally, when we pray in the name of Jesus, it recognizes the relationship we have with God through Jesus. Every time we come to God, we go, Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus, I am reminded that I'm now reconciled to my Father. We must approach God boldly. 
with confidence, without condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You know, the thing is, a lot of Christians don't know whether they are righteous or not. But the Bible says we are told we have been declared righteous. God looks at me and he no longer sees shady, but he sees the righteousness of Christ on me. We need to be coming to God, knowing I approach you as my loving father. I approach you boldly and with confidence, knowing who I am in you. Once I know this glorious truth and I stand on it and I live it out, I then know full well with total assurance that no judgment due to the wicked will ever touch me. And I can come to God saying, thank you, Lord. You will not pour out your wrath on me because you did it to your son over 2,000 years ago. And I now stand in his righteousness. When we come to God in prayer, we must come with the right motive. He searches the thoughts and intents of our hearts and discerns our motives. He's not concerned merely with what we ask for when we pray. But why are you asking? James 4, 2 to 3 says this. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. So that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. What is the right motive for praying? Jesus gives us the answer in John fourteen thirteen, And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What's the right motive? We ask in the name of Jesus for the glory of the Father. God, I ask you for this in the name of your Son so that you would receive the glory at the end of all of this. This is a big one, this next condition that I'm going to share. I believe it's something that's affected all of us at one time or another and potentially affects a lot of us to this day. We must forgive those who have hurt us. Stephen shared last week about the digging up, you know, drilling into the hardened ground and that gift being buried under that hardened ground. You know, forgiveness, it just, it buries gifting, it bur- unf- unforgiveness, sorry, it buries gifting, it buries everything. It is an important condition for receiving answer to prayer. Did you know that? If we're praying and we're seeking God and we're not seeing much happening, there needs to be some self-examination that goes on. God, show me, am I holding on to unforgiveness? What do I need to deal with to see the breakthrough? It's an area that is a common source of blockage and frustration in our spiritual walk and a a reason for failure to receive answers to prayer. Jesus said in Mark 11, 25 to 26, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, Forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. If God is our heavenly Father and if we truly are Christians, we must come to that place where we forgive. Before we pray, we must forgive. And if we're still walking in that unforgiveness, God, I need to deal with this because everything else I do is going to be in vain until I deal with this one area. When we pray, saints, we need to be directed by the Holy Spirit. We turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you take over and pray through me. This is one of the glorious blessings of being truly baptized with the Holy Spirit. When a believer has yielded themselves in this manner and the Spirit begins to pray through us. And we need to ask in prayer according to God's word. The great issue in prayer is the will of God. If I am praying according to the will of God, then as we've seen in Scripture, I know that God hears, and if I know that God hears, I know that I have the petition I ask for. So how do I know the will of God? In His Word. The promises of God, which number something like 8,000 plus, are the will of God for us. Pastor Paul so often has encouraged us, get into the word of God until the word of God gets into you. And as I reflect on this, all of a sudden, you start to join all the dots. Wow, well, when he's always said that, it's not just about, it's it's never an instruction. Let's get into the word of God until the word of God gets into us so that I can speak like a theologian or I I know the answers to things. No, 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 no. There is a far greater reason behind that. 
It is because when I come to seek him in prayer, I want my prayers answered. You know, Derek Prince has this quote he's so well known for. He says, everything that I pray, I receive. And you think, what? What do you mean everything you pray for, you get? Why do we think that is? Because everything that he prays for is according to the will of God. And how does he know the will of God? He studied the Bible his entire life in multiple languages and taught on it and knows the will of God. So naturally, when he prays according to the will of God, what's God going to do? He's going to answer that prayer. You want to see your, your prayer life dramatically shifted and changed and you want to start hearing answers to prayer? Start praying the will of God. Saints, we need to deal with anything that has been hindering our prayer life. We need to be persistent in prayer. We need to be a people that learns to tarry, that learns to wait upon the Lord, that learns to cast aside all things that hinder and say, God, what is it that you want? I might invite Josh up. I shared this morning, and I will share with you now as well, I have been sensing that for Victory Life, we have come to almost like a crossroads. We've come to a crossroads where the only way forward is prayer. We've seen God do the most magnificent things in our midst. You know, during the season of COVID last year, we heard of so many churches closing down their doors and so many churches all of a sudden moving away and things were not happening and ministries were, were shrinking. You look at the last 12 months of Victory Life and who remembers a time where we had one service? We're on two and I think we're eyeing three. Praise God for the saints gathering. We've seen cell groups grow. We've seen our worship team go from a single worship team to I think almost four full teams. We have seen God do so much in our midst. You know where that was birthed? On our knees in prayer going, God, show us. Stand with me this morning. Church, we need to, we need to come to a place where we go, Lord, we, we are not satisfied. We thank you for what we've seen, but God, we want more. God, we want more. God, we need more. God, we desire more. God, we want to see you do more, God. We thank you, God, for what you've done in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit meeting. We thank you for what you've done in our midst. But God, we want more, Lord. It's only been a taste. We want to see more, my God, more. And the answer, saints, is simple. We must pray. See, what happens when we're praying is that we are communicating with God. We're not talking at God, but we're speaking to God and He responds. We come to Him and say, God, here we are. And then God speaks to us. When He speaks to us and He tells us what to do, we are moving with His presence. We will see His glory released. We will see that the hardened ground drilled up. We will see the worlds unclogged. We will see so many things. But we've got to toughen up. We've got to press in and go, God, I will not leave the altar until I have seen you, my God, until your glory comes in our midst, my God, that you would send the fire. God sends the fire to the sacrifice. But here I am as a sacrifice. Here we are as a sacrifice, this body. So let's come out the front, saints. I want everyone to come out the front. Push these chairs back. We're going to do some business this morning with God. God, we're going to come to the altar that you would send your fire in our midst, my God.